Okay. I think this is actually my first time going live, so I'm hoping that this is working. But I'm Charlicia McKinney um, on the account today, and I'm going to be reading from Undrowned Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Animals, or Marine Mammals, excuse me. So here's our text. Of course, naturally, since um, I'm reading today, I woke up very congested, so I'll be taking things very slow. And um, I may also include some pauses for us to perhaps write or reflect. Um, I'll read the back of the book first, just for a little bit of context, and then I'll go through the preface in chapter one, and then I'll read excerpts of each chapter. So the description of the book is, Undrowned is a book-length meditation for the human species based on the subversive and transformative lessons of marine mammals. Alexis Pauline Gums has spent hundreds of hours watching our aquatic cousins. They're queer, they're fierce, protective of each other, complex, shaped by conflict, and struggling to survive the extractive and militarized conditions that impose on the ocean. With a brilliant mix of poetic sensibility, naturalist observation, and Black feminist insights, she translates their submerged wisdom to reveal what they might teach us. The result is a powerful work of creative nonfiction that produces not a specific agenda, but an unfolding space for wonder and also for questioning. The use of metaphor and natural models in the service of social justice make Undrowned an absolutely unique read. So here is the preface, which is called A Guide to Undrowning. What is the scale of breathing? You put your hand on your individual chest as it rises and falters all day, but is that the scale of breathing? You share air and chemical exchange with everyone in the room, everyone you pass by today, is the scale of breathing within one species. All animals participate in this exchange of release for continued life, but not without the plants. The plants in their inverse process release what we need. They take what we give without being asked. And the planet wrapped in ocean breathing, breathing into the sky. What is the scale of breathing? You are a part of it now, and you are not alone. And if the scale of breathing is collective, beyond species and sentience, so is the impact of drowning. The massive drowning yet unfinished where the distance of the ocean meant that people could become property, that life could be for sale. I am talking about the middle passage and everyone who drowned and everyone who continued breathing. But I am troubling the distinction between the two. I am saying that those who survived the underbellies of boats, under each other, under unbreathable circumstances, are the undrowned. And their breathing is not separate from drowning of their kin and fellow captives. Their breathing is not separate from the breathing of the ocean. Their breathing is not separate from the sharp exhale of hunted whales and their kindred also. Their breathing, their breathing did not make them individual survivors but it made a context, the context of undrowning. <laughs> Breathing in unbreathable circumstances is what we do every day in the chokehold of a racial, gendered, ableist capitalism. We are still undrowning. And by we, I don't only mean people like myself whose ancestors specifically survived the Middle Passage because the scale of our breathing is planetary at the very least. Are you still breathing? This is an offering towards our evolution, towards the possibility that instead of continuing the trajectory of slavery and entrapment, separation and domination, making our atmosphere unbreathable, we might instead practice another way to breathe. I don't know what that will look like, but I do know that our marine mammal kindred are amazing at not drowning. So I call on them as teachers, mentors, and guides. And I call on you as breathing kindred souls. May we evolve. 
I'm still holding that question. I remember the first time I read this, what is the scale of breathing? And what does it mean to consider not only being connected to humans, but also to marine mammals and to the ocean? Um, I'll also read The Forward by Adrienne Marie Brown, because this book is a part of the Emergent Strategy series. And so here's what Brown has to say. Of course, I am writing this on a 19th day. And this is a book with 19 parts. It's a week since I learned that 19 year old Black Lives Matter activist Oluwatun Sile was found dead. And it's quite possible that I have grieved in 19 ways already today. Although this kind of stranger grief is a difficult thing to track, today I created a meditation of 19 wisdoms from Black feminists listening to the through line between ancestors and living geniuses the way Alexis Pauline Gums taught me to. And it's not the 19th of any month, but of June 19th. Juneteenth, a day of liberation. Given that this is a book of liberation, I always wanted to push off into the waters today. With Alexis, things always line up in ways that humble me. Grief and magic touch, and a ripple unfolds between them that shows how they are the same thing at different moments in the nonlinear time of good life. The universe is coordinated when it comes to Alexis because she is enough to center any species that she enters, however vast. In the pages that follow, she's leading us through the oceans, inviting us to grab onto her fin as she takes us deep and teaches us how and when to breathe, how to handle the pressure of depth, where to leap and catch the sun's light. When Alexis first started posting these marine mammal missives, I thought, Oh, emergent strategy from the deep. This is a whole realm of the wide world that I have barely gotten to learn from. And that was a huge amount to teach us on how to survive, how to slow down, how we make the air last, and how we avoid predation and extinction, and how we play. I have always felt myself to be a child of the ocean, but like many black humans, the lines that tether me to distinct earth and water were cut long ago. With Undrowned, Alexis offers back to us a set of ancestors and sibling species, a variety of solidarities that can teach me about myself. I didn't know I had so much blackness in common with the marine mammal world. And this text feels like a meeting of an eccentric and wise and intriguing family. It feels like an unveiling. Alexis pulling up the salt skirt of the sea and showing us how we belong how we are echoes of the same brilliance of dolphins and seals and whales. I'm so grateful that Alexis wrote this and that she is letting us publish it as a first comrade text in the Emergent Strategy series at AK Press. And I hope you find a multitude of teachings in these pages as I did and that this work deepens your life as it has mine. So Adrian Marie Brown submitted that forward on June 19th, 2020. I remember the first day I was reading this I want to say it was maybe like February 19th or January 19th. It happened to be the 19th that I also first read it. And that had kind of, you know, shook me a little bit. So now I'll read a little from the introduction. And then after that, I'll just read the short um, intros to each of the chapters. Let me just make sure the volume's up. All right, introduction. If you happen to be in the ocean and you see someone breathing, what do you do? If you see someone like you, a mammal, but unlike you, not bound by boats and masks and land, you might wonder who they are and what they are doing and how they do it. How do they live in salt, in depth, in motion? You very well might wonder. And in that case, you would need a guidebook. The most available guidebooks around right now are the National Audubon Society Guide to Marine Mammals of the World and the Smithsonian Handbook of Whales, Dolphins, and Porpoises. They will summarize the available scientific information on the habitats, um, the habits and appearances of all the animals that they have tracked so you can identify a mammal. And later, when you get out of the ocean, you can tell someone what you saw. 
I identify as a mammal. I identify as a black woman, as ascending with and shaped by a whole group of people who were tra transubstantiated into property and kidnapped across an ocean. And like many of us, I am simply attracted to the wonder of marine life. And so I went to the aquarium and I brought those guidebooks hoping to learn about my kin. What I found was that the languages of deviance and denigration, awkwardly binary assignments of biological sex, and strange criminalization of mammals that escaped the gaze of biologists showed up in what would call itself the neutral scientific language of marine guidebooks. I just wanted to know which well was which, but I found myself confronted with the colonial, racist, sexist, heteropatriarchalizing, she really put it all in there, capitalist structures that are trying to kill me. The net I am already caught in, so to speak. So how can I tell you who and what I saw? At the same time, as I learned more about marine mammals, I learned to look between the loopholes of language, using the poetic practices that I have had to use to find and love myself in a world that misnames me daily. And I felt so much love and humility. I felt so much love and awe and possibility. I had to show you what I felt. So I posted on social media every day what I was learning about marine mammals from and despite the guidebooks through my own further research, after futurist speculation, and what was happening to my heart. Instead of simply identifying what was what, I had to go deeper. I took my cue from the many marine mammals who echolate. I had to focus not on what I could see and discern, but instead where I was in relation how the sound bouncing off of me in relationship to the structures and environments that surrounds me locates me in a constantly shifting relationship to you, whoever you are by now. As I continue to post what I was learning, my Instagram followers speaked, excuse me, spiked, and people gave me watercolor journals of whales. They mailed knitted humpback whale earrings, sent me actual vertebrae of a whale, for real, and more. I also got messages online every day asking when and where they could buy reflections in a book. Offering to be my research assistant, testifying that these posts have become daily meditations and offering to collaborate on creating apps, song-based audio meditations, and one special message from Adrian suggesting that these writings could be a part of the emergent strategy input at AK Press. So here we are. So this is a different kind of guidebook for our movements and our whole species based on the subversive and transformative guidance of marine mammals. Where emergent strategy offers us the opportunity to study and practice the work of shaping change by understanding ourselves as part of the ongoing emergence of nature, this guide to undrowning listens to marine mammals specifically as a form of life that has much to teach us about vulnerability, collaboration and adaptation we need in order to be with change at this time. Especially since one of the major changes we are living through, causing and shaping in this climate crisis is the rising of the ocean. And the other is that the pandemic emerged while I was sending back copy edits for this book that also threatens our breath. I don't see this book as a critique of the two guidebooks I mentioned Instead, I see this book as an offering to you and as an artifact of process that I am in the midst of a marine mammal apprenticeship. If there was ever a time to humbly submit to the mentorship of marine mammals, it is now. Did I mention that the ocean is rising? Have you noticed the adaptation of our breathing? This is a pragmatic course of study and at the same time, Part of what is at stake for me in this apprenticeship is a transformed relationship to my own breathing. The salt water within me, the depth of my grief, and the leagues of my love. And in order to have space for the relationship to learning and unlearning that is necessary for me in this process, I have to do some work to disrupt the violent, colonizing languages of almost all the texts in which I have accessed information about marine mammals in their lives and families and superpowers and struggles. 
The Autobahn and Smithsonian guidebooks are the sources of unattributed quotations in this book. And I start with the meditations mimicking the cadence of objectivity that guidebook entries perform. And I'm doing that on purpose because I want to remember that it's a performance and I want to transform it. In this book, I move mostly without warning from a clinical tone to a profoundly intimate tone. The words I love you appear more than any other phrase in this book. I'm sure those words have never appeared in scientific studies about marine mammals. My hope, my grand poetic intervention here is to move from identification, also known as the process which we say what is what, like what dolphin is over there and what are its properties, to identification. The process which we expand our empathy and the boundaries of who we are become more fluid because we identify with the experience of someone different. Maybe someone of a whole different so-called species. This is a tricky task because I'm vulnerable not only to the messiness of my emotions, but also to the possibility of just projecting into a whole set of beings who cannot verbally protest my projections. And though the systems of oppression that harm me also harm advanced marine mammals, we are not having the exact same experience. In other words, this is not a book in which I am trying to garner sympathy for marine mammals because they are so much like us, though we do have many things in common. Instead, the intimacy, the intentional ambiguity about who is who, speaking to whom and when about is undoing a definition of the human which is so tangled in separation and domination that is consistently making our lives incompatible with the planet. My task here as a marine mammal apprentice, opening myself to guidance from these advanced marine mammals is to identify with, to see what happens when I rethink and refeel my own relations, possibilities and practices inspired by the relations possibilities and practices of advanced marine mammal life that is an emergent strategy if interlocking underground communication of trees and dandelion res re resilience and responsive networks can inspire us to relate within and across species differently so can marine mammals and the emergent can feel for real I'm mostly asking questions of myself and of you in this text. We get to continue to consider what is possible from here and here and here. And since I can't help but notice how marine mammals are queer and fierce and protective of each other, complex, shaped by conflict, struggling to survive the extractive and militarized context our species has imposed on the ocean and ourselves, this work is accountable to the movements that are boldly seeking to transform the meaning of life on the planet right now. Movements for black liberation, queer liberation, disability justice, economic justice, racial justice, and gender justice are at the core meditations that are included here. But these are still meditations. So instead of proposing a specific agenda, or predetermined set of instructions, these meditations open up space for wondering together and asking questions toward a depth of engagement that is, yes, still emerging. The book consists of an introduction and 19 chapters, it would be, or 19 movements. It would be too linear to say chapters, organized around black feminist practices like breathing, remembering, collaborating, as they can be informed and transformed by learning from marine mammals. Okay, so I think I'll pause there in the intro. And I'll skip over to this section. So it asks, who is this book for? And it says, this book is for you. Also known as everyone who knows that a world where queer, black, feminine folks are living their most abundant and expressed and loving lives is a world where everyone is free. I imagine that most people will not read this book from front to back, but I have still organized it based on the black feminist marine mammal principle of flow. 
just in case. I imagine that folks will work with one meditation at a time as part of a daily meditation practice. And so far, people have shared with me that they have excerpted these meditations during their own keynote lectures, use them as a way to start the day or to launch writing prompts of their own. So there are many different ways to kind of engage with this text. And so I'm going to now go through um, the introduction of each of these movements, as she calls it. So the first one is about listening. How can we listen across species, across extinction, and across harm? How does echolocation and the practice many marine mammals use to navigate the world through bouncing sounds change our understanding of vision and visionary action? Is social media already a technology of bounce, of throwing something out there and seeing what comes back? This is where we start our trans-species communion, opening a space to uplift the practice of listening even more than the practices of showing, improving, and speaking up. Listening is not only about the normative ability to hear, it is a transformative and revolutionary resource that requires quieting down and tuning in. Two breathe. Breath is a practice of presence. One of the physical characteristics that unites us with marine mammals is that they process air in a way that is similar to us. Though they spend most of all of their time in the water, they do not have gills. We too on land are often navigating contexts that seem impossible for us to breathe in, and yet we must. The adaptations that marine mammals have made in relationship to breathing are some of the most relevant for us to observe, not only in relationship to our survival in an atmosphere we have polluted on a planet where we are causing the ocean to rise, but also in relationship to our intentional living, our mindful relation to each other. With meditations on the different ways that the narwhal, beluga, bowhead, whales breathe in the Arctic, the ways that baby seals learn to redefine breath in infancy, the relationship between the endangered North Atlantic white right whale and my Shankok and enslaved ancestors, and even a surprise visit from a black tip reef shark. This section offers us opportunities to look at what blocks our breathing and what stakes of society that puts profit over breath. May our breathing open up to the possibility of peace. Three, remember. What do we remember and what do we forget? How do we name and categorize what we can barely observe and for what purpose and with what results? For example, there is only one marine mammal that the dominant scientific community calls by their indigenous name. They are supposedly impossible hybrid dolphins along the route of the triangular transatlantic traffic trail to capture human cargo that divide species. There is a battle for the domain name Amazon in which huge corporations have more leverage than the ancient rainforest, a whole region of the planet. What do we need to remember that will push back against the forgetting encouraged by consumer culture and linear time? What can we remember that surround us in oceans, in history, in potential, and how? Four, practice. What are the intergenerational practices that, genera that generated dorsal fins in some dolphins and whales? What are the experience-based wisdom resulted in the ever-expanding spines the blubber of bowhead whales in the adaptation of sideways swimming river dolphins. What do blue whales know that lets them fast all day and sing across the planet? I believe in the possibility of dorsal and stabilizing practices in our own lives. I am committed to the development of backbone and core muscle. Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Turn 
So I believe in the possibility of dorsal and stabilizing practices in our own lives. I'm committed to the development of backbone and core muscle in the crooked life for at least one person with scoliosis. Me. We can cultivate practices for finding each other in a shifting world. We can each create an intentional approach to what we take in and also what we put out. What are the intergenerational and evolutionary ways that we become what we practice? How can we navigate oppressive environments with core practices that build community, resistance, and more loving ways of living? Five, collaborate. What does it mean to function as a group in a changing environment? How can we organize ourselves intentionally to combat the embedded isolation of late capitalism? It seems like the dolphins and other interloping sharks and mantra rays that have something to tell us. From mothering as an emergent strategy and massive dolphin superpods to pantropical synchronized swimming as a model of being prepared for large scale direct action the dolphins are educating us on how to squad or pot up. Are we ready for a dolphin informed replacement of the patriarchal family with schools of unlearning? What is the relationship between the circular collective feeding practices of mantra rays and the black diasporic history of cooperatives? I believe collaboration is natural and can also be reclaimed. Six, be vulnerable. I wonder what our sensitive edges have to teach us. What do our mortality and openness mean to the ecology we could surrender to together? In this section, I explore my own strange teeth, our tendency to hurt people who have already been hurt in similar ways to us, and what it takes to actually lead on the issues that have impacted us most. Marine mammals live in a volatile substance whose temperature is changing for reasons not of their own making. Their skin is always exposed and they are surrounded on all sides by depth. What could enable us to live more porously, more mindful of the infinite changeability of our context and more open to each other and to our collective needs? Seven, be present. Here we are, where presence meets offering, looking to Indus River dolphins who live by constantly using sound to mark where they are, spinner and Benaguela dolphins who do somersaults for no scientifically agreed upon reason. What could it mean to be present with each other across time and space and difference? Presence is interpersonal, it's interspecies, and intergalactic, and in some ways, it's eternal. How can we rethink our presence on the planet and its precarity by paying attention to the Indus dolphins who have brought themselves back from the brink of extinction? Could we learn to love the humpback whale beyond its marketable mythology and love ourselves beyond what capitalism tells us is valuable about ourselves? Marine mammal mentorship offers us the chance for presence as celebration, as survival, and its excess as more than we ever know how to love about ourselves and also how to love each other. Okay, I need to take a quick (laughs) second to blow my nose. But um, thanks for listening. And I guess I'd be interested in whatever is, is... standing out to anyone so far i'm still thinking about that first question of what is the scale of breathing i still don't know quite how to answer that and i i will i feel like every time i'm congested it's like i never appreciate breathing more (laughs) than when i can't and so it, it does feel apt in some ways to be reading this today All right, eight, be fierce. Did you hear about the rainbow breathing whale that straight up swallowed a white South African diver? 
Marine mammals live with a graceful ferocity, navigating treacherous circumstances daily. What can we learn from the orca, for example, about the sad farce of human dominion? Or from dolphins that demand fish from the humans who impinge on their food supply? Or from the leopard seal who is so fierce I dare compare her to the incisive Toni Morrison? Not a comparison I would ever make lightly. But what is our bravest breathing? And what is our unapologetic action toward self-determination? Nine, learn from conflict. Some sea lions only fight for 15 seconds, but some suffering from disease outbreaks have begun to eat their own young. Looking at the responses of sea lions to species scale difficulties, I use this section to prompt us to learn from and be intentional about how the harms closest to home are both forcing and teaching us to evolve. How will we spend our time if we realize that the conflicts we are experiencing now urgently demand that we create a more loving world as soon as possible? 10. Honor your boundaries. A hooded seal gets everything they need to travel the world from only four days of nursing. No one knows how the seal ended up in a freshwater lake. The Amazon dolphins in captivity may be dying from sleep deprivation. What are the boundaries that we choose and do not choose? What are the distances we need and what are the walls that will isolate and destroy us? How can we discern the differences between generative boundaries and destructive borders? Are we ready to move towards nourishing forms of adaptation? She's asking like the best questions. Now I see why each <laughs> each beginning is kind of a meditation in and of itself. And then each chapter or movements, not chapters, go into more detail. So 11, respect your hair. One of the major things I found when I studied guidebooks about marine mammals was that much of the same language that fuels racism, gendered binaries, and other forms of oppression shows up in scientific descriptions of marine mammals. Most of these descriptions are also written by white Western men. This section looks at the hair of seals and walruses and whales in connection with hair discourses within our species in order to reclaim the bodily feature most entangled with racial definition after skin. Inspired by Bob Marley's quote, trust the universe and respect your hair. I am interested in a marine mammal, a tuned redefinition of hair that is a life-giving technology. What does hair mean and what does it protect? And how could we honor hair as both a boundary and also as a teacher? Twelve, in capitalism. I guess I could have started here. Let me be clear, the actual suffering and endangerment of marine mammals on the planet right now is caused by the extractive, destructive processes and consequences of capitalism. The meditations in this section look at the uh, Atlantic white whale, which are on the brink of extinction because of the commercial fishing industry, finds it expensive and inconvenient to change their practices. We look at the fate of the striped dolphin and Greece's attempt to save its economy by allowing dangerous oil drilling in their habitat. We ponder the strange state of the world where impoverished individuals, fishers, actually kill marine mammals because they perceive them to be threatening competition in a fishing market where they already cannot compete. These are all examples of what capitalism means on interspecies scale. At the same time, this section uplifts a former lobsterman who risked and gave his life as a part of a crew of people who untangle right whales from deadly nets. 
and an indigenous-owned fishing company that is actively fighting against the extinction of the New Zealand white front dolphin. Um, as hope and instruction towards moving into right relationship with the planet and each other by ending capitalism as soon as possible. And earlier, Alexis talks about the net that humans are caught in as similar to the net the marine mammals are caught in and how capitalism and heteropatriarchy and gender violence entangle us in similar ways. 13. Refuse. And then there are the marine mammals that have most effectively escaped observation. For example, the deep diving beak whales, many of which have never been positively identified by Western scientists. The Atlantic gray whales who disappeared during the slave trade and just have recently reappeared. And the Hawaiian monk seals who were regenerating themselves on military bases that have shut down in the archipelago. In conversations with theorists such as Cydia Hartman, Horton Spillers, Kevin Kwashi, and Eric Stanley, Wahina Lubiano, this section honors what, is ref what, what it means to refuse to be seen, to be known, and to participate when politics, as we know them, have prioritized recognition by and access to the, parent, to the dominant paradigm. What becomes possible when we are immersed in the queerness of forms of life that dominant systems cannot chart, reward, or even understand? <coughs> Excuse me. And here's uh, the last section of this um, meditation on refusal. If the gray well is ready to return to the Atlantic, am I? What is the clarity of my digestion, my knowledge of what can nourish life and what cannot? What in me will not tolerate the intolerable? What is the trajectory of my underwater trail? My mark on the planet, my refusal. The body of gray whale is like a map. It's a plane of scars and barnacles and lice. A living environment itself, replete with evidence. And could I ask myself with every decision, every complicity and move, what is at the bottom of this? What indentation am I making on the surface of this earth, even if it is so far underwater that no one can see. At the bottom, there is love, so complicated that it doesn't dissolve, and yet we cannot digest it. At the bottom, there are choices, even if they seem microscopic in scale. At the bottom, who you were and what you were became a whale, and please come back to me with all your scars and your patterns. I will seek you at the bottom of myself and breathe you up and out of my crown. I will remember you and breathe your stolen breath. It is not small what happened to tear us apart. It is not over either. At the bottom is greed. But my love is textured. It's massive and it's scarred. My love is breathing. It's writing. It's path. My love is made from who you are. My love, I hear you in my gut, and so I stay, and so I leave, so you can return. Alright, meditation 14, surrender. And what happens if we just let go? Like dolphins who beach themselves on shores to eat, and trust the tide to bring them back into the water? Or who times their birth cycles to seasonal floods or migrate across the world following warm currents on a menopausal planet? What would it take to tune in with our environment enough to be in flow with the earth instead of in a struggle against it? Inspired by the evolution of the extinct prehistoric Laviatan 
Melville, <laughs> uh, is a so-called sea monster ancestor of the contemporary sperm whale. From the beginning, from being in the largest, sharpest teeth to a being who uses those same teeth, those same teeth, not to kill or even to chew, but to listen. I wonder if we or the species that comes after us can turn our weapons into weather vanes in time. <coughs> All right, there's just a few more left. Meditation 15, go deep. What does it take to go deep? below the surface of current events and social media reactions. What would you allow to look at what is under your actions and under that and under that? Sperm whales dive a mile deep. Maybe they can give us some advice. And the ocean itself has so many depth lessons. When you think you've reached the bottom, there is sometimes still deeper to go. Take a breath. So in meditation, um, in this meditation, meditation 15 on going deep, there's a guide for diving deeper. And here's what it says. One, breathe. Two, take responsibility for your forehead. Three, hush. Four, be, be flexible. Five, be specific in your actions. Six, listen. And seven, come back. Meditation 16, stay black. There are several practices of marine mammals that resonate with black freedom movement strategies and tendencies. The scientific surveillance and profiling technologies that describe marine mammals hold much in common with the systems that criminalize blackness too. From the young Norwal as a black unicorn, in Audre Lorde's sense of the term, as a whale whose Latin name means pumpkin head, to the slim back panther of the ocean, to the extinct Caribbean monk seals who were the first victims of Columbus and whose blubber was used literally to lubricate the plantation infrastructure of the region, this section explores black kinship with marine mammals and the possibility of solidarity, of love, of chosen family, new traditions, and abundant survival. Meditation 17, slow down. Where do you think you are going so fast? This section offers slowing down as strategic intervention in a world on speed and an appropriate response to the exact urgencies that make us feel we cannot slow down. It is the speed, the speed boats, the momentum of capitalism, the expediency of pollution that threatens the ocean, our marine mammal mentors, and our own lives. What if we could release ourselves from this internalized time clock and remember that slow is efficient, slow is effective, and slow is beautiful. I really love that. Whenever I'm like working on my writing and I feel so overwhelmed and like I'm not going fast enough, I always remind myself that slow progress is still progress and when I slow down, I can actually observe more. Meditation 18 rest and so there is time to rest like sea elephants who spend a whole month just snuggling and shedding their skin pusa seals who dive deeper postpartum and spend more time alone gray seals who offer a third of their body weight while nursing and leave to regenerate themselves this section argues the urgency of rest the necessity of regeneration and the depth rest reveals and also allows. Meditation 19, which I think this might be the last meditation before the activities. Meditation 19, take care of your blessings. 
The black feminist author and pleasure activism ancestor, Tony Cade Bambara, used to sign her emails, Take Care of Your Blessings, an acronym of her initials, TCB. This section looks at the revolutionary parenting and community care practices modeled by marine mammals. Consider seeking seals who use delayed implantation to give birth when and where they want life to enter, or marine otters who make their bodies into rafts for their children. Note crab eater seals who organize themselves to protect parent-child bonding in the range of what scientists call the allo-maternal behavior of marine mammals that adopt each other beyond birth relation or even species. The question is, how can we best care for each other across generations, across borders, and across other barriers? Or as Audre Lorde said, we must be very strong and love each other in order to go on living. Okay. So then uh, the Meditation 20, it offers some activities. It looks like there's a solo version. So let me look ahead to see if there's also like a group version. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just read through these. I guess if, if folks want to write these down. So I'm also looking, yes, yeah, slow, slowness being enough. Go slower if you want to go. Yeah, I always find so much comfort in reminding myself that I not only can, but often like have to slow down. <laughs> okay, so here are some offerings of activities that you can do by yourself. And then after that, I'll read the collaborative activities. <coughs> okay. Okay. So, to practice the meditation of listening, she suggests recording yourself reading one or more of these meditations. Playing the sound of your own voice reading the passages or a video of you signing an ASL at different times of the day. What do you notice? What is different about what you notice when you engage the recording first thing in the morning as opposed to when you go to bed or in the midday? Breathe. Track your breath. A deep intimacy with the breath is crucial for all marine mammals. Use these passages as a measure. Read aloud and see how far you get with one breath. Try this at different times of the day and notice if there are any differences in your breathing based on the time of day or based on the subject matter of the passage. The meditation to remember. Choose a mantra. There may be a short phrase or a sentence in this text that contains something that you need. That you need to remember for this part of your journey. So start with one. Memorize it as a mantra and repeat it to yourself as a meditation. Start with saying it at least 10 times in one sitting. You can expand your use of the mantra by saying it once a day or writing it out or placing it on a visible place in your home or workspace and notice when it might be time to choose another mantra. This is another thing I've started doing recently. I've created a Google Doc of writing mantras or just things I want to remember before I start writing, and it has been really helpful. All right, an activity for the meditation of practice. Choose one of these lessons and transform it into a daily practice. For example, meditate with the mantra from the Remember activity 88 times in one sitting every morning at sunrise or something else. An activity to practice collaboration. Brainstorm. Who do you think of as your pod? Try out this pod mapping worksheet created by Mia Mingus and the Bay Transformative Collective, Justice Collective, excuse me. And there's a link in here, but I assume maybe if you type that in, it might come up. Um, but do you have multiple pods for multiple situations or for different parts of your life? Make a list or as many lists as you need. You may want to do some of the group versions of these activities with some of the people on the list. Hashtag pod life. A practice of being vulnerable. 
We are often most vulnerable in our areas of growth. Out of all the movements in this book, what is the area of growth for you right now? Is it respecting your hair, ending capitalism, resting? What would be a brave action for you in relationship to that area of growth? It could look like reaching out for support if you would usually go it alone. It could look like being compassionate with yourself and making space for your feelings about it. Notice how you feel. Reflect on where growth is happening in your body and in your relationships and in your work. An activity for being present. Presence is a shifting context that takes practice. Marine mammals live in a water in a substance that perpetually moves and moves them and also us when it moves. So I offer you this meditation practice. Choose a marine mammal that is featured in this book and listen to a sound recording of them or watch a video of them. Try to rec find a recording that is at least five minutes long. Humpback whale sounds will most likely be the most broadly accessible, she notes. And listening to the marine mammal recording, count your breaths. One inhale and one exhale counts as one breath. Count each one, and if you lose count, start back at one and reflect on what you notice. Um, an activity for being fierce. At least one of the refusals in this book can fit on a protest sign or a graphic t-shirt, so make it so. Learning from conflict. Dedicate a passage of this book to someone you are currently in conflict with. If it is not possible or beneficial to actually send them this passage, study it yourself with them in mind. What does this particular passage have to teach you about conflict? How does it reflect the situation you are navigating? Take on the perspective of different figures in the passage, the speaker, the marine mammal, the fishing industry, and scientists, and work on this for three days and take note of what you learn. An activity for honoring your boundaries. Choose a quotation from this book and to use it as an outgoing voicemail message or an automatic response email for at least one day. Let it do the explaining for you. An activity for respecting your hair. Use a mirror or your hands to get in touch with one strand of hair on your head, face, or body. Continuing to breathe, stay connected to that one strand of hair and notice it in your relationship to the hairs around it. Like a walrus, ask it is what it ask what it knows and write a letter to yourself from the perspective of that one hair and listen carefully. An activity for ending capitalism. We can end capitalism one transformed relationship at a time. Choose an aspect of the economic system that entangles marine mammals mentioned in this book and change your relationship to it for a period of at least 30 days. For example, I have a commitment not to eat anything sourced directly from the ocean. Is there one product that fishing boats extract that you can shift your relationship with? Your relationship to oil or to tourism? Shift one relationship for at least 30 days and see what you learn about the interconnectedness, complicity, possibility, and freedom. An activity for refusal. Inspired by one of the marine mammals featured in the refuse section of this book or in the entire book, choose an area of your life to which you can say no this week. An activity for surrender. If you can, get in some salt water and float on your back for a solid three minutes. If that is not a possibility, choose any of the activities in this section that require you to choose a passage from the book and instead of choosing, open the book randomly to a page and use that passage. An activity for going deep. Take one passage from this book and do further research. An activity for staying black. If you're living in the world as a black person, good job. You've already done so much. Choose a passage in this book or in the Stay Black section in, the, in particular that affirms you and sing it to yourself. Two-step with it. Rub some lotion on you while you read it and thank you for being who you are. If you are living in the world as a non-black person, ponder the unknowable within yourself. Choose something that living as a non-black person in an anti-black world has taught you and decide to unlearn it. 
Search the internet for the meaning and context of some of the references in the Stay Black section that originate in various black cultural practices and learn with reverence. <coughs> An activity for slowing down. Cancel one thing this week. Just one thing. And during that time, look at the live feed of orcas or just see if an orca emerges at any moment or go to sleep and let the orca watch you. I really like that. An activity for rest. Take this book to bed with you. Open to any page and read that passage over and over again until you fall asleep. If you dream, write down the dream and then read the passage again. An activity for taking care of your blessings. Make a list of those loves that are sacred to you. Those relationships that are closest to your heart at this time. And brainstorm how you can model a form of care exemplified by a marine mammal in this text to each of those loved ones. Okay. That's the end of the um, solo one. But it also continues with a Potter Squad version. So to close out, I'm just going to reread the preface. And then we'll be done. <laughs> What is the scale of breathing? You put your hand on your individual chest as it rises and falters all day. But is that the scale of breathing? You share air and chemical exchange with everyone in the room, everyone you pass by today. Is the scale of breathing within one species? All animals participate in this exchange for release of continued life, but not without the plants. The plants in their inverse process release what we need and they take what we give without being asked. And the planet is wrapped in ocean breathing, breathing into the sky. What is the scale of breathing? You are part of it now and you are not alone. And if the scale of breathing is collective beyond species and sentience, so is the impact of drowning. The massive drowning yet unfinished where the distance of the ocean meant that people could become property, that life could become for sale. Yes, I am talking about the Middle Passage and everyone who drowned and everyone who continued breathing, but I am troubling the distinction between the two. I am saying that those who survived in the underbellies of boats, underneath each other, under unbreathable circumstances are the undrowned, and their breathing is not separate from the drowning of their kin and fellow captives. Their breathing is not separate from the breathing of the ocean. Their breathing is not separate from the sharp exhale of hunted whales, their kindred also. Their breathing did not make them individual survivors. Instead, it made a context. The context of undrowning. Breathing in unbreathable circumstances is what we do every day in the chokehold of a racial, gendered, ableist capitalism. We are still undrowning. And by we, I don't only mean people like myself whose ancestors specifically survived the Middle Passage because the scale of our breathing is planetary at the very least. So, are you still breathing? This is an offering toward our evolution, toward the possibility that instead of continuing the trajectory of slavery and entrapment, separation and domination and making our atmosphere unbreathable, we might instead practice another way to breathe. I don't know what that would look like, but I do know that our marine mammal kindred are amazing at not drowning, so I call on them as teachers mentors and guides and i call on you as breathing kindred souls may we evolve thanks so much for joining us today um thank you for the emily taylor center offering this series um and thank you for your your comments and your reflections and your questions i don't really know how to i'm trying to figure out how to end this in a way that saves it maybe if i just stop it it'll do that but thank you all so much i hope um that there's something that resonated with you today again here's the cover of the book thank you all <laughs>